Good evening, everyone. I'm Carmel Burke, Chair of the UGIA Women Northwest, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the UGIA Women's Summer 2020 series for an inspiring evening, an audience with Lucia Harish and Samantha Simmons. In a time of uncertainty for all, of fear, worry, and for too many, heartbreak, UGIA has not stood idly by. When I served as an operation sergeant in the IDF, we were trained to adapt to changing circumstances quickly and effectively. I can assure you, UGIA has adapted and focused its efforts to direct support to where it is needed so swiftly that it would impress even the toughest Israeli commanders. And we have done it while staying true to our mission and aims. We continue to build connections with Israel for young Jews and families during lockdown with exciting and informative interactive programs. Israel Tour for 16 year olds is life changing. It is what made me leave Finland and join the Israeli army. Lifelong connections with our homeland and lifelong friendships are forged in that magical month. This year, 1,216 year olds have missed this opportunity. But rather than shrug our shoulders, we launched a summer engagement fund, providing £100,000 to be shared among community initiatives aimed at engaging with our youth and strengthening their connections with Israel and their Jewish identity. The youth movement, which many of us were members of, would be struggling to survive without income from Israel tour and summer camps. These have been supported by UJIA. We have set aside and distributed funding to them so their futures can be secured and they can continue to engage and develop future generations. And we have continued to fund our projects in Israel to ensure that during this crisis, our support is available to those who really need it. UJIA has targeted our efforts in the impoverished Galil region, where a huge parts of the population still live below the poverty line and thousands of children are deprived and hungry. Our project develops skills, they ensure educational opportunities and they provide the tools that are needed to so underprivileged Israeli citizens, Jews, Arabs and Druze and the many other groups who help make Israel so diverse and unique have greatly enhanced life chances and equality. What we have achieved is truly humbling, but we will not stop as long as there is even one child in poverty. We cannot do this without your support. Between March and May this year, UGIA stopped fundraising. We recognise that frontline charities have greater immediate needs to raise emergency funding for their heroic, life-saving work. But our work remains a lifeline for many, and the recent exponential growth in anti-Semitism throughout the world reminds us how important a strong, diverse Israel is. Because we cannot meet face-to-face, we set up this virtual series to replace our annual women's events, which so many of you attend and donate generously to. Please continue to support us as if this was a live event. Please buy raffle tickets. And whilst these are tough times, please donate what you feel able to. It really all makes a huge difference. so much to UJIA and to Daraba. Thank you so much for the Everett lessons. They've given me something really fun to do in lockdown. Hi, I'm Shari, and I'm going to study the social work. 
אין כמעט מלגות לאימהות אה, בגילאי 45. אבל היה לי קושי, היה לי קושי כלכלי אה, משמעותי. הגעתי לכאן בזכות המלגה שלכם. אני מרגישה שהמלגה הזו כל הקהילה הרוויחה. בתקופת הקורונה הייתי פעילה חברתית מאוד משמעותית אה, ביישוב. וכל זה, כל זה קרה בזכות המלגה שלכם. I love getting my PJ library book with this picture inside. I also liked reading the book Pitcher and the Baker. I also liked going on the website and doing all the recipes. But my most favorite bet was learning my new favorite Hebrew word, Shema, because I love the sun and playing outside. Hi UJA, I'm Rose from Unistream Jewish Center. Through our um, quarantine period, we had Zoom meetings with our head center. Not only did we get all the lectures and information that we needed to continue working, um, we also learned new skills from Unistream. It was hard, but also very, very fun. We learned a lot. We really appreciated you contacting us. We really appreciate your support and um, that you wanted to know about what's going on and how we're dealing with the whole thing. <laughs> כן הצלחנו לשמור על קשר עם זה עם החניכים שלנו ועם זה עם ההורים שלהם. הלו, זה הילה מהחניכים של החניכים. Here at the children's village, because of the coronavirus, we've been staying in the house with the kids that cannot go home for the past uh, month and a half. And thanks to your donation of the computers, we have been able to let our kids join their classmates and participate in uh, lessons. So thank you. Stay home and stay safe from the children's village. Thank you for the lessons. Toda Raba! Thank you, UJIA. Thank you very much. Rabbi Lord Sack said, Acts of kindness never die. They linger in the memory, giving life to other acts in return. If you are able, please donate. And now I have the absolute pleasure to welcoming our guests tonight, Samantha Simmons and Lucia Harish. Samantha is a highly respected journalist and broadcaster who in a career of over 20 years has presented for BBC Breakfast, BBC London, Sky TV, and now presents BBC World News. Samantha is married with three children, and on top of her busy work life and homeschooling her children, she still finds time to produce her own podcast, It's a Grown-Up Life. Samantha, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. In a country known for producing inspirational women, Lucia Harish stands out. Lucy is a news anchor known for her fearlessly reporting the news with integrity and for speaking from the heart. Lucy was born in Dimona as a Muslim Israeli Arab. At just five years old, she saw the face of the hatred and violence which, bl which blights the region when a terrorist attacked a family car traveling through Gaza with a petrol bomb. After studying journalism, she became the first Israeli Arab to present on the mainstream Israeli news and has hosted programs on Channel 10 and Channel 1 and worked as an anchor for the renowned I-24. When I said Lucy reports the news fearlessly, to give you an example of her courage, she faced up to a Hamas commander during Operation Protective Edge, accusing Hamas of using civilians as human shields. In 2015, Lucy was awarded, awarded one of Israel's highest honors, to light a torch at the National Independence Day ceremony on Mount Herzl. Lucy, we are absolutely delighted to have you with us this evening. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for having me. And it's a great honor to be with you and to be with Samantha. Thank you very much for having this interview. And now, Samantha, I am handing over to you. Carmel, thank you very much. Lucy, lovely to meet you. It's a shame it's not in person, but hopefully one day in Jerusalem, as they say. 
in Jerusalem or in London. <laughs> or in know. London, exactly. It doesn't matter. One day, hopefully, we'll all be able to travel again somewhere, anywhere. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, first of all, I'd like to kind of take you back to your roots and you to tell us about your childhood, about what it was like growing up as a Muslim, Arab, Israeli in Demona. Wow, it's, um, you know, I cannot say that it was a walk in the park, uh, but it was um, not only challenging, but eye-opening. Um, you know, I'm always, um, as people are always asking me this question, and the first thing that I'm saying is that I was blessed that my parents decided 47 years ago to um, create their, their own family um, in Dimona. Uh, 47 years ago, my parents decided that they're leaving Nazareth. They're originally from Nazareth. And they decided that they're leaving Nazareth because they wanted to create something else. They didn't want to stay in, uh, we're calling it in Arabic, the, the uh, family Hamuli, uh, the, let's say the, the tribe uh, uh, family. Uh, and um, they decided to move to Eilat. Um, and then after a year that they lived in Eila, they decided that they want to go back to Nazareth. And on their way back, they stopped uh, for a coffee uh, in Dimona. When they stopped for a coffee, uh, my, my uh, father's uh, brothers were working in Dimona. And one of the constructors there asked my father if she's looking for a job. And my father looked at my mom and he told her, okay, so what do you say? Maybe we will stay here. And um, one thing led to another. They said, okay, we will be here for a year. And it's been 47 years since then. Um, you know, it's not, whomever, anyone who's been in Israel know that um, Dimona is, um, let's say, semi-secular city in the south of Israel, very tr more traditional, you can say, uh, than other cities um, in, 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 in Israel. And um, we were the only Muslim Arab family there uh, in a period of time that it was not so easy. So for my mom to raise three daughters uh, in, in a city where they were the only um, Arab Muslim family, um, it was not so easy. I remember that one at one night, uh, the night before I went to the first grade, um, my mom sat me down for you know a small chat uh, in the living room, and I was five, five and a half years old. And she sat me down and she told me, listen, Lucy, no matter what people are telling you, no matter what people are, are saying to you, no matter how much they will beat you up, no matter how much they will curse you, I want you to always remember that you're Arab, that you're Muslim, that you're Israeli, and you're proud of it. It's a huge conversation for a five yeah. and a half years old because you say to yourself, okay, and what am I going to wear tomorrow? Uh, you're talking with me about this huge uh, thing about being an Arab and Muslim and Israeli and being proud of it. And I back then, I didn't know why for my mom it was very important for her to have this specific conversation. But then, you know, with the years, I, I, I realized that it was just after we went through the bombing in Gaza Strip and the terror attack in the Gaza Strip. And after the terror attack, I was very traumatized. I was traumatized because um, it was... Um, it's a long story, but 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 eventually after the story, I I really hated Palestinians, and um, so just I, let let let's let's touch on it briefly. <laughs> we, we only have half an hour, and there's loads yeah, and loads yeah, of things I, I want to ask you. And you weren't just involved in a terror attack; you were deliberately targeted, you and your family, weren't you? Yeah, we were deliberately uh, targeted because uh, the, the 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 terrorists uh, thought that we are a Jewish family. Um, of your number plate. Because of the yellow yeah, uh, license plate. Um, you know, it's, it's a time where a lot of Israelis used to go to the Gaza Strip and used to have their shopping in the Gaza Strip. And, and for me, the Gaza Strip was like a trip to the Gaza Strip was one of the most amazing things that I, like my family, could have taken me to. 
And it, I remember that it was a Saturday morning and um, my uncle came to visit us with his uh, wife and his two children. And he asked my dad to to take a trip to the gas strip. And, and my father told him, listen, I, I know that the security situation there is not that good. So maybe we should postpone it. And to make a long story short, we decided to hit the road. And, you know, the word karma, like every single thing that, that happened that day showed us that we were not supposed to be there. So we went to the supermarket and the supermarket was closed. And then we went to buy some fish and the fisherman was sick that day. And from there, we went to this uh, pharmacy, like clothes uh, shop uh, that we, uh, that my mom used to buy us clothes from. And um, I remember getting into the, the, the shop and, and the guy was just like, the owner of the shop was just about to close. And my father is asking him, why are you closing the shop? It's like, what, what happened? And he told him, well, you know, the security situation is not that good. And, and people here are talking about an intifada. So, but you know what? You made it all the way from Dimona. I will open up the shop for you. And I remember that every time that I got there, I remember that I asked my mom for one thing. I asked her for red nail polish. And she always said, no, I, I no, it's not, it's not pretty. It's not nice that a little girl is putting red nail, uh, nail polish on her uh, fingers. And I remember asking my mom the same thing like again um and i asked her mom can i have the red nail polish and that specific day she told me you know what yes and i just grabbed the red nail polish and i got back to the car and just when we were about to leave and they couldn't find anything in the shop we went back to the car and just when we were about to leave the owner of the shop came to my father and he told him just do me a favor um until you're going after the gas strip um close the windows and my father is looking at him and he asked him why. He told him, just put a sign, put a Quran on the dashboard, put a newspaper in Arabic. And my father is telling him, why are you saying that? And the guy just looked at my dad and he told him, listen, people might confuse you with being Jewish. You have a yellow license plate, so an Israeli license plate. So please do that. And my father looked at him and he told him just, Khalia Allah, leave it to God. And we started like driving and we hit traffic. And I remember everybody were like laughing and talking in the car. And I started looking outside and, and, and I saw this figure getting closer to the car and I couldn't understand who he is, but I was so like hypnotized by him. He was very impressive, like tall and very thin. And, and he had some scars on his face and he had this like, you know, um, piece of, uh, uh, of jewelry that, that said Allah, God on his neck and like a necklace and 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 something about him not only hypnotizing but I, I was also scared by him because i saw him getting closer and i saw something in his hand and i couldn't understand what it is so i started like scrolling down my seat uh and my mom is looking at me and she's telling me lucy sit straight and i was like not looking at her and looking directly outside and i was like watching him getting closer and my mom is shouting again lucy sit straight and I'm looking at him and there was a point where he looked me straight in the eyes. And the third time that my mom uh, yelled Lucy, there was a huge blast in the car. Like two Molotov cocktails, one inside the car, one outside the car. The second thing that I remember was my face hitting the ground. I got up, I saw my mom crying and I looked and on the other side, I saw my uncle's wife screaming. And I looked up and I saw my cousin going into flames and my father is trying to put down the fire. And the only thing that I was looking for was where is my red nail polish? I, I didn't want to realize what was happening there and, and what I was experiencing. And I didn't want to digest the, the screaming of my father screaming to people, we're Arabs like you, we're Muslim like you, like why you're doing this. And that was what I like got out of this terror attack that I don't understand why Arabs hit us. I don't understand why Palestinians hate us. And um, since that day, I really hate the Palestinians. And I, I, I walked around and I said, I hate Palestinians. We need to kill them. We need to murder them. We do. And my extended family just came to my father and told him, listen, she hates, she's our family. And she hates herself. She hates who she is. She hates who we are. You need to explain to her that this doesn't work like that. And my mother told him, you know, 
she will grow up and she will understand that life is more complicated than that. So looking back, I understood why for my mom, it was really important to have this like conversation, this chat with me just the day before I'm going to the first grade, that I'm Arab, that I'm Muslim, that I'm Israeli, and I need to be proud of it. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, um, it's a thing because my mom was already well known with the situation because my sisters um, already went through like some beating and bullying in school uh, because they were Arabs so and Muslims. And, and, you know, I went back, I went to this, the second day to school and I sat down and, you know, the teacher is asking you, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And I was like, ah, and she's like, yes, uh, I'm Lucy and I'm Muslim and I'm Arab and I'm Israeli and I'm proud of it. And the teacher's looking at me like, okay, I understand who's going to make some troubles this year. And then I said it like very proudly because my mom said so. Um, the second day and the, first, and the third day and the fourth day, I started getting beaten up. Um, at five years old. At five years old, getting beaten up. And I didn't understand, I have to tell you, Samantha, why I was beaten up. I, I, because you don't, you say, okay, the kids, like, they don't know me. Like, yeah. they don't know who I am. So how come they hate me already? And um, I think that um, very, very, like, rapidly, I, I rapidly, I, I started, like, doing everything and showing everybody that I'm good and that I'm better at things. And, you know, sometimes I, 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 I used to say that kids are mean, but kids are not mean. We're educating kids to be mean. Kids are not born to hate. Um, we are educating kids to hate. There's no such thing as a kid coming out of his mom saying, like, you know, I hate Arabs. It doesn't work like that. Like, we educate kids to hate Arabs. Uh, there's no such thing as a kid coming out and saying, I hate Jews. There's no such thing. We are educating kids to hate Jews. It's, it's, it's all about the education that we're giving our children. And it's all about what our children are getting from uh, where they're living and from the education system that they're are, that they are in. And um, so, so I can say that next to the to the bullying and and, and hitting that I was getting, I, I was really blessed because um, I had amazing teachers, and I had an, I still have an amazing family that supported me and always showed me good uh, in like in human beings. Uh, it showed me too much good in human beings that until the level that when I got out to the world at the age of 18, I thought that everybody are good. You know, well, that's interesting. That's interesting because you were five and you had these two life defining experience being targeted in a terror attack and then suffering prejudice from your co five year old schoolmates. Um, and yet you talk about love and that being the predominant factor in your life until the age of 18. How do you feel that those experiences, though, shaped you or did whatever negativity you had felt, was that kind of overruled by the, the love and comfort you had from your loved ones? You know, Samantha, uh, with all the experiences that I had in my life until today, by the way, uh, until recently that I, two years ago, I got married with uh, this beautiful, amazing Jewish man, which is... Which we will talk about in a minute. Yeah, we will, we'll discuss that, don't worry. I really even, it's very difficult for me to say a Jewish man, you know, I, I fell in love with a human being and I fell in love with the men uh, that I found my my other half and, and this, you know, but, but because of the titles, because everybody are talking about titles and this one is this and this one is that. So I've been going through a lot of experiences in my life and a lot of racist experiences in my life until today, you know, just um, this, thing, I am all targeted. Uh, by the extreme right here in, uh, in Israel, calling me that I'm a terrorist, terrorist of the media, that uh, I uh, should not have the ability to uh, speak up. They are demanding my firing from the IDF radio that I have a show on. You know, it's it's I'm being targeted every day, but it was very easy for me to be a hateful person. It was the easiest choice. It's really easy to decide that you hate the world. You hate Jews, you hate Arabs, you hate Muslims, you hate Palestinians. You, really, I hate you all. But I think it was more difficult for me and much more challenging for me to uh, challenge myself 
to understand the other side, whether I like their opinions or not, whether I like uh, what they think or not. Um, Do you remember making a conscious choice to be that person, to not go down the negative route, to not be a hateful person? I think that it um, it hit me after I, um, I I lit the torch on Israeli Independence Day. That was five um, years ago. Five years ago, um, you know, lighting torch in in Israeli Independence Day. It's one of the biggest, greatest honors that a citizen in the state of Israel can get, and. You know, I was targeted all over. I was targeted by Arabs, Israeli Arabs, and I was targeted by Palestinians, and I was targeted by the Jewish extreme right uh, uh, side, and I was targeted by by people who thought that I'm not allowed to get this honor because I should be thankful that I am, like, every day that I'm actually living here and I should not be even questioning anything. And after that, I realized that... Um, being targeted all over because a lot of Israeli Arabs thought that I am betraying my heritage and I'm betraying my my history and the history of the Palestinian people and the history of what happened to the Palestinian people. And on the other side, um, uh, people from the Jewish community said that, um, what did you do? You didn't do anything. Why you should get this honor? Uh, this honor is preserved only for Jewish people. It's not uh, preserved for you. Um, so when you get all this, I remember uh, that when I got on the stage and I said the sentence for the glory of the state of Israel, and I was I was lighting the torch for a reason. I the, the this year, it, it 2015 was um, uh, like the title of, uh, of of lighting the torch was uh, Israelis breaking through, and uh, the, what the committee decided is that I broke through the barriers of uh, fighting racism and fighting for pluralistic ideas in the Israeli in, in Israeli society, and the minute that you know what I, I was very happy. I did, for this reason, but I was really sad. Like, to light the torch for this reason. Because I couldn't understand why in 2015 you need somebody to break through in pluralistic ideas and 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 race and, and fight racism in Israel of 2015. And but the minute that I went on the stage and I went on Mount Herzl. And I lit the torch, and the torch represents one of the Jewish tribes of Israel, of Bnei Israel. And I lit this, this torch, and I spoke in Arabic, and I spoke in Hebrew, and I talked about making no difference between Jews and Arabs and, and Muslims and Christians and Druze. I think that this minute I understood that I had, I signed a contract. I signed a contract with the Israeli society that the minute that I'm saying for the glory of the state of Israel is the minute that I know that I cannot back up uh, or back down from this contract because this con contract is for life and it's for good and it's for worse and it's for the, the, the second that you understand that uh, people will hate you and people will love you. And I have to decide to take my strength from the people who support me and from my family and from the, you know, at the audience, my parents, uh, they sat in the audience with my sisters, two sisters, and they sat with two other people uh, that I call them my Jewish parents. It's Shimon and Miriam. And they are my, my mom and dad's best friends. We grew up with them. We like they were our family in Dimona. And when I looked at the audience and I saw my Jewish parents and I saw my Muslim parents sitting together in this event, I understood that, you know, I'm sorry to say that in this language, but uh, fuck them all. Fuck all the, the haters, you know? It's just like I, I, I'm the winner. I won. I won because this is possible. Life and, 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 and coexistence is possible in Israel. And what the, um, the, the let's say, um, loud minority, extreme minority is trying to do is to just silence the peaceful majority. And unfortunately, Samantha, the peaceful majority 
is has been silenced. We are not speaking out enough. We've been silenced by 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 this this bully, uh, um, very extreme, uh, racist, uh, loud minority. And because we said to ourselves, okay, I don't want to get there. I don't want, it's not, it's not for me. It's like, it's be, it's be below my level. It's like, yeah. we're not having conversation with, with, with people like this. And at the end of the day, we cleared the stage and we gave these extremists the stage and we, the peaceful majority ended up by looking outside and saying, Oh my God, how come this is happening? How come everything is happening in front of us? It's happening because we are silenced and because we decided that we don't want to speak out. Well, this, this, there's a lot going on in Israeli politics at the moment. There always is, but now now more than ever, um, which we could talk about all night, but I really want to focus on your story because it's such an interesting one. And we've already heard about some of your early years, but you know, as a fellow journalist and news presenter, I'm really interested to know your motivation, what inspired you to become a journalist and, and to break through to become the only or the first female Arab Muslim news presenter in a predominantly Jewish country. So take us back to the sort of beginning of your journalistic career. What inspired you? Wow. Uh, first of all, I wanted to be an actress. I, so did I. I. I really wanted to be an actress. It's it's amazing. You're like on potential like actress. I think actress, that's the thing about news, news yeah. presenters. They just want to be on screen, basically, whichever which way. <laughs> no, I just remember that I I majored in theater in my high school, uh, and I knew that I'm going to be an actress. And then I came to my mom and dad, and I told them, "Listen, I want to be an actress." And my dad looked at me and he told me, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, you are not going to be and going to work in something that is not work. That is not." That's what my dad said to me. <laughs> Do whatever you want with your hobbies in the future. Go and study something that you can actually earn money from. And I went and studied political science and journalism. And you now uh, journalism is not, uh, unless you're a Christian Ammon poor, uh, you know, it's not something that you earn a lot of money. Uh, so, you know, know. Yeah. So, you know, it's especially in Israeli, you know, media. Uh, it's not something to be uh, rich from, but um, like very rap, like rapidly, I I understood that I have something to say, that my story is is a different story, that um, it's some kind of a, um, I, I can say that my background. I, I saw like a lot of discussions on TV about concerning Arabs and Jews and, and about this, this new Israel because we're still still trying to find the definition of Israeli. It's like if you will ask a lot of Israelis, what is being Israeli? What what does it mean? You we don't have like a, an exact definition for that. And I understood, I think, very at a, at a very early age that. Uh, I'm this new kind of Israeli that nobody can define, and and it's it's something else than than what is happening in the Arab Israeli community or the Palestinian Arab Israeli community, or the Jewish Israeli community. This combination, because in in, in like most cases, uh, Arabs and Jews are living in the same country, but they're not actually living together. We are not, we're living under the same roof. We're living under the same sky, under the same sun. Sometimes we're working together. Sometimes we're studying like in Haifa, for example, or Nazareth uh, in some, or Akko, uh, Acre. You know, some places in Israel, there is like coexistence, but it's not coexistence. Yeah. We're not studying in the same schools. We're not, um, you know, uh, Israeli Jews usually go to the army. At the age of 18, Israeli Arabs are going to the university at the age of 18. Um, when they meet finally in the university, you will see this gap, this age gap. Like you will see, you will find that the 25 year old uh, guy or girl that are coming to study for their BA, and they will meet the, the, the 25 year old Arab or Muslim women or men that are already on their way to their PhD. It's like, like every 
is not, you know, synchronized like in, in a proper way. And I think that um, the minute, because I lived on both societies, I I think that I, I realized that um, there's there's another kind of Israeli that maybe we're not prepared for it as a society yet. Uh, and I think that this is why um, my marriage to Tzachi was like in, in your faces all. Like, you know, uh, what we are creating here is totally something else. Like, for example, the story of Tzachi is that he was the, the Jewish kid in the diaspora. Like, he was the only Jewish kid uh, studying among Christians. And he was always... One of his amazing stories that really like connected to my stories was the one when he was in the kindergarten and 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 his mom is saying that he came back crying one day because everybody got uh, uh, a cross and he didn't and he asked his mom mom why don't I get a cross everybody got a cross I want a cross and his mom went to the kindergarten teacher and told him give him a cross it's like it's my kid is studying with you you cannot make him feel that he is exceptional. So you brought in your husband. So I need. I feel that we need to share with the audience who he is because I'm sure there's a lot of Fowder fans out there. So they will probably know who he is or will have yeah. seen him on the screen. And one of the stars of the first two series of Fowder, mm -hmm. Sahi. Now I'm not sure the pronunciation. Alevi. Yeah. Alevi. Okay. So you've been together seven years now. He's Jewish, as you said, a Jewish man. You're a Muslim Arab woman, um, mm -hmm. and you kept your relationship a secret for a long time, didn't you? Uh, yeah, so, uh, a lot of people ask me why, why it's like you know it's love. Why? So first of all, it was difficult for both of our families. It's not, it wasn't easy. But you know, the minute that we got married, like the day of our marriage, everybody understood why it was kept a secret. Uh, the second that our marriage were out, it was a political issue. It was not a personal, it's not, it was not an, uh, you know, um, two people who are on TV, uh, you know, uh, well, no, it's like that. it was a political issue. People were talking about assimilation, people were opening their, the, the, the parliament, like. Yeah, you Knesset. were denounced and the Knesset, yeah. weren't you? Like everybody were talking about it. politicians open open their meeting, like government were meetings. You shocked? Were you shocked? Were you shocked by that or prepared? I was, you know, I was I said that well, it's going to be a bomb. You know, it's going to be a blast, like it's going to be a huge blast for Israeli society. So this is why we need to make it like a controlled blast. Like we need to control the blast. This is why we decided that the day that we're getting married, this is the day that we are announcing our relationship, basically. Uh, this is why it was brought by surprise, because nobody thought that I'm in a relationship and nobody thought that Sahi's in a relationship. Like the media knew and, and the media, like uh, journalists um, uh, from the media realized that it's not... Listen, there, there's a Samantha a lot of us on Israeli society. Um, I am going through like social um, media bullying every single day. Um, people, people are wishing me every single day to have dead kids, uh, not to be pregnant, uh, like ever. So I won't get uh, any terrorist kids. Unfortunately, I'm saying that what is happening to Israeli society is very, very, very worrying. Uh, we are on the edge of um, a war, but a civil war. It got to a point where if you are different or think differently than the majority, and I'm saying the majority because it's not the majority. This is why I was speaking about the silent, peaceful majority. Uh, but if you're like talking against the majority, you will find yourself targeted. If you're a leftist, if you think differently than the government. Do you if think it's worse for you being a woman? Yeah. And it's worse being a woman, Arab Muslim, married to a Jewish man. 
I was invited a few months ago to Washington to, uh, you know, an event. And I was talking about my marriage and I was talking about uh, the relationship that I had with Tahi. And, you know, I, I realized that um, they, some of the people in the audience didn't like the, the poster girl of assimilation. And I saw some people are moving like uncomfortably in their chairs. And at the end, I was like, it was very important for me to say to these people that the fact that Tahi, that me and Tahi got married, or that Tahi married a Muslim woman, it doesn't mean that Tahi stopped being Jewish. It doesn't mean that Tahi is not still doing Kiddush on Shishi. It doesn't mean that Tahi is not uh, fasting in Yom Kippur. It doesn't mean that in last uh, the last Shavuot holiday, we saw in our apartment, my family, my family and his Jewish family on one table, a Jewish festive. So it's very easy to be stuck in your stereotypes. And it's very easy to say, oh, my God, she took, you know, people actually t said this to me. You took one of our best. You know, and how do you respond? How do you feel? You know, it was so, so strange because I, I got, like, I got into a shop when, when this woman told me, I, I went for shopping, like, I went for, like, you know, for yeah. shopping in one of the stores, and I looked at her looking at me, and she told me, oh, you're Lucy from TV, right? And I told her, yes, and she told me, just so you know, you took one of our best, and I looked at her, and I told her, I, I, I don't understand, he didn't take one of our bests. It's like, what is this? Mm. What is this you took one of our best? What do you have? Do you own people? Do you own religion? And the same thing, by the way, I'm saying about um, the Arab society, you know? Uh, the Arab society, some of the people in the Arab and the Muslim society, they didn't accept this, that they didn't like, you know, congratulate me on this marriage. Um, most of my extended family didn't congratulate me on this marriage. But, you know, you don't owe religion. You don't owe uh, how, like, you don't own people's lives. Like, every single person can live the way that he wants to live. What it is the concern of the interior minister of Israel to open a government meeting with my marriage? It is, it is it is shocking it is shocking um where do you find the strength and the resilience to cope with that to build a strong relationship through um, all that negativity and the, the the hate I suppose um you know it's uh, we laugh a lot basically on that it's like we we um, I, I really humor. Yeah, a lot of humor, a lot of humor. Um, really, I really found other. I, this is why I told you it's very difficult for me to say I married a Jewish man. I married Tahi. Uh, that it was that had some, you know, issues by being a man. Okay, <laughs> not not it got nothing to do with the fact that he's Jewish. Just with the fact that we had we had problems at the beginning, like any other woman or men have in their the beginning of their relationship. Um, you know, men are different than women, and I should not tell you that. You probably know that. But you know, it's like I fell in love with his heart, with his soul. So a lot of people are telling me why you didn't convert to Judaism. I didn't ask him to convert to Islam. I didn't ask him to change his religion because I think that the tradition of Tzachi is very important for him and for our children to know, our future children, to know where they're coming from, what is their grandfather and grandmother's tradition, what they're going, like, it's, it's part of their, their life, it's part of their, their history. And I on, was, on, on this note, we've got a question in from Yael who asks, have you ever wanted to stop being in the limelight to avoid all the hate and targeting? Uh, I 
think that <laughs> I think that um, you know I have like the idea of leaving Israel ten times a day. Like I, really? it's, it's like go through. Yeah, it's like I, I want to. Sometimes I'm saying just that's it. I want to get up in the morning, and I just want to be Lucy. Just you know, going to work, going to work uh, like on BBC. You know, I don't know, like in uh, any other local news. Yeah. Channel, whatever. Yeah, and, not a man. You know, Yeah, and you know, to do my job and go back without anyone judging me, the first thing that people are judging me is because I'm Arab. Like, people will tell you why you didn't condemn this and why you didn't condemn that. And you know, it's like I'm working like I'm a, a condemnation uh, machine that I need to wake up in the morning and say, okay, I condemn what this Arab or this Muslim did, and I condemn this terror attack. And I can have, you, you should do that because you're Muslim and you have to condemn things. No, I just, sometimes I just want to wake up and say, okay, just going to work. And, and then I'm saying, again, it's the easy way out. It's the easy way to say, okay, I'm leaving Israel and that's it. And, and I'm putting everything behind. And, but this is my country. You know, I, I, I love You don't country. want to be forced out of your home. No, I don't. I, I don't want to be forced out of my home. I don't want to be forced out of my country. I grew up here. I care deeply about what is happening in Israeli society. And, you know, I hate the fact. Of, of watching every single thing that is happening in Israel society these days. Because, you know, I'm, I'm always saying, for me, loving your country is like loving your parents. You love your parents to death. You will do anything for your parents. You will really, like, get out of your skin to help them. But sometimes you say, okay, Ah, I'm not going to raise my children the same way that my parents raised me. And sometimes you have some criticism about your parents. Does that mean that you don't love your parents? Does that mean that you don't like your parents or you hate your parents? No, it means that you love them, but you criticize them. The same thing with my country. I love my country. I would do anything for my country, but I criticize my country because I want my country to be glorified. I want that this phrase that I said in 2015, I want that Israel... Like, I want the glory of the state of Israel because the glory of the state of Israel is not by only sentence, is by actually looking at one another in a little bit different way than we're looking at one another right now. Going back to the lighting ceremony and the honor and how um, privileged you felt, but conflicted also at the same time, what was the reaction? This is a question that we've had in from somebody who's watching. Um, what was the reaction from the Arab community when you had wow. this honor? Uh, like I said, the, the reactions uh, were not good. Like some parts of the Arab society said that I I forgot who I am and I forgot where I came from and I forgot all the atrocities that Israel did to the Palestinian people. And on the other side, on the closer side, um, my mom was prevented to see her mom for almost two and a half years because I lit the torch because they said that I am, there's no entrance for sluts and their daughters who are sluts. Where, where does your mom's mom live? She lived in Nazareth. Right. And my mom went to visit her and she was not allowed to get in. And- um, Your family I, suffered retribution by you doing that. Yeah, I think that my family suffered a lot of my, some of my decisions. But I think that the beautiful thing about my parents is that they never, ever, ever um, left my back. They've never they questioned your judgment or what you're never. doing or told you to stop. Because I, I am the fruit of their education. I am the fruit of, of, of what they raised me on. This is how they raised me. This is what they told me as a child. They said... You know, this this specific conversation with my mom, uh, like just before I'm going to, just no matter what people are telling you, no matter how much they are beating you up, just remember that you're proud of who you are and, and I'm here. And, you know, for me, um, I know that I caused a lot of suffering for my parents. 
I know that I did that. Uh, like, you know, community things like family issues. And I think that the only thing that I wanted to do is, is cause them suffering. But, you know, watching my parents and seeing them and watching them so bravely, like targeting and, and talking and answering and fighting against everyone. You know, I'm saying I cannot back up now. I cannot back down from this because, you know, it means that their fight was was for nothing. And I'm not willing that their fight and their suffering will be for nothing. Another question from somebody who's watching. As a young woman who broke through a number of glass ceilings, what's your advice to those looking to follow in your footsteps? Wow. Uh, it's not an easy way. Uh, unfortunately, we're in 2020 and we're still talking about glass ceilings for women. Uh, I'm not even talking about glass ceilings for Arabs or yeah. in Israel. Uh, for me, uh, I, you know, I grew up, I remember that when I started working on Channel 10, like it was 13 years ago. And there was like this huge, you know, tile, like this huge, like on, 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 on um, huge notice, like on, on the newspaper, like the first Israeli Arab anchor on Israeli mainstream Israeli TV it really made me laugh. Um, and I remember that one of the anchors when I was working in Channel uh, Channel 10 came to me and told me, oh, Lucy, you are Arab. you are Muslim, you are woman you are coming from the periphery of israel uh you are like all the don't do in one woman just like the only thing that is left is that you will be a lesbian and then like it's, it's completely <laughs> like you broke every single glass ceiling oh, in the wow. world. and you know I, it's not only that i broke like the glass ceiling of israel it's not easy to be a woman in any society Okay, we are living it. We are living in the Me Too era. We cannot like this, the, like the, not see this. It's it's happening in front of our eyes. Uh, but I came also from a very close traditional society, which is to break this is 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 like after you're breaking this, like the patriarchal, um, like father figure society and you're going out of this and then you're breaking this and then you're going on saying oh the israeli jewish society is more open um, no it's like you're going out there and you're starting to find your way and to find your path as a woman in men's world and for me you know i was blessed because my father was a minority at home we are four women my mom and Two other sisters, he couldn't say a lot. It's like he's always saying, I'm not gonna, they're controlling my life. I cannot do anything. But I was, you know, uh, raised by a feminist dad that believed that I can do anything and I should do anything from fixing a tire, flat tire, to fixing the wires in, 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 in like the, the, you know, in the electricity at home. It's like every single thing. Uh, and my mom taught me how to be a woman. You know, I'm always saying my dad taught me how to be a man and my mom taught me how to be a woman. Like, you know, how to dress uh, in a nice way and how to make up in a nice way and how to look good. And, and you know, I was raised by two parents that they were not educated, Samantha. They didn't go to universities. They they only, my father finished seventh grade uh, and went out to work uh, to bring food to his family. And my mom finished 12th grade and, and, and she didn't go to university. She got married two years after. So I, but I raised by the most smart, sophisticated, uh, very like, you know, wild, um, they, they were traditional, like they were traditional Muslims, but they were open-minded people because what they did took like a very brave step for them in the 70s to take their, you know, clothes and they take their packages and to just decide that they're not living in their own society. They're going and living in a totally different society and they're trying to do something else for their own future. And for me, it's like I said, I started by telling you, I am the most, the luckiest person on earth that my decided that my parents decided to take this decision. 
Lucy, your parents sound absolutely incredible. I'd love to meet them. I'd love to meet you in person. We've got a lot in common. My dad tried to teach me how to t change a tire once. It didn't go Why so not? well. <laughs> you could teach when me. We'll meet up. <laughs> For a car tire changing lesson. Um, really interesting to hear your story. You're so articulate and passionate and interesting and inspirational. Um, and I really do hope I don't do get to meet you in person one day. We wish you the best of luck for the future. And uh, there were a lot of questions, so I'm sorry to all of those whose questions I didn't manage to ask, but thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna hand back to the UJA team now, I think just to finish off. Samantha, it's a great honor for me to be interviewed by you, you know, it's uh, it's, it's amazing for me. So thank Not you very much. Not at all, thank you. And, uh, thank you very much for everything. Wow, um, Samantha and Lucy, thank you so much. It was an absolute privilege to sit here and listen to that conversation. Um, Lucy, you shared some very personal stories and views with us. Um, your wisdom, your determination, your courage are an example to, to all of us. And thank you so much for sharing this with us tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak out loud and to speak openly about everything. I know uh, sometimes I get myself into trouble so when I speak openly about things. But thank you very much for giving me the stage and thank you very much for like welcoming me uh, to UGIA. Thank you very much. And Samantha, you interviewed Lucy. Uh, we saw such a professional at work. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, absolutely loved it. And loved hearing her story as well. Really incredible woman. Agree. And I want to take this opportunity to just remind you of our third and final event in this series, uh, which will be next Monday at 7 p.m. It's a conversation with Deborah Joseph, who is the chief editor of Glamour Magazine. She will also be interviewed by the amazing Samantha Simmons, who you've just listened to. Um, the registration details um, are on screen now and the winner of our amazing raffle will also be um, announced at the end of that event. Um, so nothing else left from me, um, just to thank you all again for joining us and for your ongoing support for UJIA. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>